the unseen world of the Bible, session 14, not of this world, 29th of January. All right, I have some objectives for me this morning. First, that we should be able to describe how Christians serve as sacred space, and then to explain what Jesus did in hell and now does in heaven. Thirdly, to pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ in baptism. And then, how to renew our allegiance to Jesus Christ in the Lord's table. The theme then this morning, we Christians are the temple in which God's spirit resides. Thus, dark powers watch our behavior to know where our loyalty lies. You are from below, I am from above. You are this world, I am not of this world. Well, and Jesus was speaking to those who were trying to become his enemies. He's reminding them, just back in the Genesis, when the God had created the first humans, and they fell into disobedience through the devil. The devil, the Lord God said to the devil, there will be enmity between the woman's offspring and your offspring. Of course, he was talking about two kinds of humanity those who obey Jesus Christ and those who do not. And then, of course, he said to his followers, You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Earth, when we respond to the Lord Jesus Christ in our loyal faith, how we behave in the world becomes the evidence of whom we really believe, whom we obey. Now, we have encountered a couple of unusual concepts in the uh, course and through uh, the reading of the book. One of them refers to cosmic geography. Domains ruled either by Yahweh or by lesser gods. <laughs> and the second concept, that of sacred space. Wherever God chooses to meet with human beings, a couple of examples, in the First Testament there was national Israel, narrowed down to a temporary tabernacle and eventually becoming centered in a physical temple with appropriate ritual and sacred space that only priests were allowed to enter. However, under the New Testament, all believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and congregations of believers and even ministry teams within those congregations become sacred space where we meet with the living God. So in this room, there's a lot of sacred space. Right, there really is. Don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Every, even individual Christians, if God dwells uh, in you and in your midst. In Christ Jesus, you Gentiles too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the spirit. Right. You see, biblically, it was difficult for some to comprehend how Gentiles could ever have access into the sacred space without converting to Judaism. Under the Gospel, Gentiles can likewise become sacred space. In fact, many Jews would have to become converted to Jesus Christ, though without becoming Gentiles. Where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. The promise that Jesus gave to Peter in Matthew 16 was that whatever you bound or loose on earth will have been bound and loosed in heaven. Some take that to mean that Peter's church is the only one that has that authority. Whereas in chapter 18, he gave the same promise to the rest of the apostles as well. So there really are 12 original churches. But then the basis of that, his explanation, was that wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And so when you and another believer or another believer or two choose to do a work for the Lord Jesus Christ, you become sacred space. And the Spirit of God dwells in you and with you. Back to um, 1 Corinthians 3.16. The you there, is that singular or plural? That's the way they translated it to make it sure it's plural. Yeah. So is it in that verse, is that verse teaching that we ourselves as individuals are the temple of God? Or to add a um, southern translation to it, 
don't y'all know that y'all are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in y'all? That's right. All right. Uh, does the Holy Spirit come and dwell in an individual believer, aside yes. from participation yes. in the body of Christ? Yes. Yes. But the emphasis of Scripture is that the Spirit is in your midst when you gather, He is with you. Now, what can we do to maintain this sacred space? How can we protect it? How can we enjoy it more? Churches. How do they maintain their sacred space? Let's start with a First Testament example that we've studied earlier. The goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. This was when the high priest laid his hands upon a goat. There were actually two of them, remember. One was offered in sacrifice to Yahweh, but ritually the sins of the people were placed on the second goat, and that one was sent out into the wilderness to Azazel. Put the hands on and send the goat outside. But the part about him going to the devil uh, is that extra biblical. Extra See, when Jesus went out into the wilderness, okay. as, our, as our sin bearer, whom did he meet there? The devil. The devil. And that was where he was tempted. And who is Azazel? The devil. The devil. We have a parallel then in the New Testament regarding congregations. And this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Unfortunately, it just happens in the life of a congregation that believers can be misled into sinful behavior. When that happens, we find out about it, we come around them, we pray with them, we counsel them, we lead them to repentance. But once in a while, somebody resists. They don't want to repent. In that case, in order to maintain the sacred space, we have to take steps to separate that individual. And when we do that, however, it's for the destruction of the flesh. What does that mean? Kill them? No. Well, we really don't want the devil to kill them. We do, however, want them to become so embarrassed, depressed, regretful for their actions that they will repent. Through the destruction of the fleshly desires. desires. So when the uh, bishop in San Diego, California, uh, excommunicated a certain lady representative in the House of Representatives because of her stand on abortion, what was he trying to do? Bring her to repentance. Exactly. By denying her access to the table, to the Eucharist, as they were to call it. And this is one of the main things. When you come to realize what God is trying to do in us and for our congregation during our communion services, we learn that this is one of the major ministries that we have to our own body, is that renewing of our pledge to Christ in the community. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is something that Baptist churches, at least in North America, don't like to talk much about. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us for a changed life. I think partly because of how talk about the Holy Spirit has been so abused by certain denominations and charlatans uh, in the public place. However, it's simply true that those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ effectively nailed themselves to the cross with him. And as such, we, we become sacred in space, his spirit comes and dwells in us with power to lead a holy, righteous life. We were more discerning with regard to ourselves, then we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Part of the Lord's table is self-examination, having time to think about this, to be reminded of the great truths of the cross, dealing with sin, appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit, 
and to realize that when I take communion, I am declaring the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. To whom? To each other? But to whom else? To spiritual witnesses. Spiritual witnesses. Who are those spiritual witnesses who are watching? The devils, the demons, the fallen spirits, they're watching too. As well as the holy angels of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first Sunday of this coming month. When we take communion together, let's you and I determine that this is going to be my declaration before all of the spirits, as well as these human witnesses, that I belong to Jesus Christ. And some were taking it so lightly by not examining themselves right. that God killed them on the spot. My wife counsels me not to go into this issue of why, <laughs> so many, why are so many sick in our midst and why have sin died so young? Because it probably has more to do with environment, lifestyle, poor nutrition than with a sinful lifestyle. Uh, and out in the world, we go even farther. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior of Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Okay, it's your good behavior out in the world that will draw more attention about your faith, who you are, what you believe. And then, of course, what happens at baptism. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, nor in that, just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Not only just live with the life of Christ in us, but leading a new kind of life on the behavioral realm, the emotional realm, of course, renewing of our mind constantly. And it's a promise of Scripture. But we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. The body ruled by sin can actually be done away with. Not permanently. This is something we have to do often. A way of living is letting the, the power of the Holy Spirit, obedience to Jesus Christ, actually change how we live in order to maintain sacred space. So we come to this text that this book, our book dealt with, Sacred Space in Baptism. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. So what's going on here? Baptism now saves you? Why do Baptists find that text so troublesome? Why we never quote it? Because we're already saved. Um, well, we're reacting against the Roman Catholic doctrine of baptismal regeneration. Exactly. And so, since we do not believe in baptismal regeneration for infants who have no faith, baptismal regeneration for those, for those who come to the baptisms with faith in Christ, that's perhaps a little more to the point. However, it's not having sacred water thrown on you or the removal of, of uh, dirt from the body. <laughs> Ancient times, the mikvah, the ritual bath, was considered to be a way by which you ritually removed defilement from your body before you go to present yourself at temple. Reason for which some estimate there may have been as many as 700 mikvahs on the main routes leading to the temple, so that the thousands who would come to the feasts could have their body cleansed, purified, on their way. Well, here what's called a pledge of a clear conscience. Let's try to deal with that, unpack that for a moment. Uh, baptism now saves you. The term here in the NIV translated pledge, I looked this up in the lexicons, and it has two meanings. One, the content of asking, meaning a question, and secondly, a formal request or an appeal. We're actually asking for something. Now, the pledge has a translation by those who are putting the onus on the believer, whereas the Greek is putting the responsibility upon the power of God to actually transform us. Conscience here has three meanings. 
all of which can come out in Latin, to <laughs> French, into English as consciousness, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> or the conscience, I know that's wrong, and there's conscientiousness. I'm going to do my very best. Which do you suppose it is? Well, I'm wondering, does this mean an appeal to God to have all of our sins forgiven? Since that's what Jesus promised to those who would obey him. So, here's my tentative interpretation. You don't have to believe this. I may even be called in by the elders on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it expands in contrast with the evil conscience of the fallen watchers in the book of Enoch, which we'll have to discuss in a moment, for whom there is no sacrifice, human beings, by their baptism, appeal to God to have their conscience cleansed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, thereby <laughs> renouncing Satan and his agents. Of course, since North Americans don't think about angels and demons, we, baptism comes down to some little formula such as your uh, public testimony. I make a couple of points about baptism. Yeah. Uh, one is it is ironic that as Baptists we underemphasize the importance of baptism. The other is um, we had dinner with a group on last night with one of the missionaries who we support and ministers to the Muslim world, and he was emphasizing the the critical importance of baptism in uh, for Muslim converts and. They, many of them don't really consider themselves to be Christians until they are baptized. And if they are not baptized fairly soon after their profession of faith, they're more likely to go back to Islam. To be sent into hell is not unique in the New Testament or in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the other ancient faiths also talked about it. There was Atis, the Phrygian god of vegetation, he went down into the underworld. Dionysus, sometimes called Bacchus, the god of wine. Then there was Enoch, of course, the seventh from Adam. By the way, if you go into the, your text in Genesis and count down how far Enoch is from Adam, how far is it? The way Americans count, it's the sixth generation. But the way the Hebrews count, you include the first guy as well. Yeah, so he's the seventh if you include Adam. We do that in French language a lot. Uh, so, in English, next Sunday is how many days from now? Seven. Seven. In French, it's aujourd'hui en huit. How many? Eight. Eight days, because you count today as well. <laughs> Who's right? <laughs> Seven and a half. <laughs> Heracles, the son of Zeus. Ishtar herself, the ancient Akkadian goddess. Uh, Krishna in the Hindu system, he went down there for a while. And Orpheus, and my wife has to pronounce this for me. Persephone. Oh, Persephone, okay, the wife of Hades, making her the queen of the underworld. Now, the book of Enoch, our, our reader suggests, lies behind some of the verbal choices that are made in the New Testament. We read, for example, in Hebrews, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. All right, so the New Testament acknowledges that the teaching of the First Testament was that this Enoch never experienced a physical death because God had taken him. Have you ever wondered where he went and what he did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So did the pre-Christian Jews. And so some of them wrote a book about it. It's a long, fascinating, I don't call it a fairy tale, but it's very legendary, explaining all the trips and travels that Enoch took throughout the creation and all of the things he saw and the places he visited and the creatures he talked to. 
So, a few things about this Book of Enoch before we go further. It is one of many then current Jewish writings. In fact, they had hundreds, many of which are still, still exist. And real Bible scholars will comb through those ancient readings while they're producing their commentaries on the First Testament books and the New Testament books. But it does provide details surrounding Genesis chapter 6. These sons of God who came down, who habitated with women, apparently had children that were called giants. Oh, who are they? Where did they come from? What has happened to them? Are they still around? Well, the Jews are asking the same question, and the book of Enoch talks a lot about them. It uses a term, the watchers, which also occurs as a term for angels in the biblical book of Daniel, because most of these are written in Aramaic language. In other words, these spirit beings that are watching us. Thirdly, the New Testament writers quote from the book of Enoch, or they allude to it, at the very least, they're saying the same things that Enoch said. However, we do not believe, maybe you do, I don't, I do not believe that the book is inspired, and it was never part of the Christian canon, nor of the Jewish canon, canon being, meaning the recognized inspired books. Why would it, uh, New Testament writers, Allude to it. I have a list, if you're interested, of 67 non-biblical allusions and quotations found in the New Testament, including Greek philosophers. So why not? If they said something useful that readers would recognize as either authoritative or probably true, hey, it bolsters our argument. Go to YouTube, type in Book of Enoch, you will find hundreds of videos claiming that evil church leaders took Enoch out of the Bible uh, because they don't want us to know the truth. You know, the Dan Brown uh, approach to uh, the scripture. What did Enoch had something to say about the Lord's coming? Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. <clears throat> Does that sound like any New Testament text you can think of? Maybe Jude. Maybe Jude. <laughs> At least 14 through 15. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, is there any mention of Enoch's descent into hell? Uh, let me explain for a moment here. During uh, Enoch's travels, Remember, the book of Enoch doesn't claim to be written by Enoch, but by Enoch's great-grandson. So he's describing what he had learned. I don't know how he learned it. In his travels, he came down to the underworld, and there were those fallen so-called sons of the gods, or sons of God, of Genesis 6, that are being held down in Tartarus, or Hades, or hell. They plead with Enoch, since you have so much favor with Yahweh, could you go explain to him that we're really sorry for what we did? Couldn't we get out of this place? I wrote out your petition, but in my vision, thus it appeared that your petition would not be granted to you for all the days of eternity, and complete judgment has been decreed against you, and you will not have peace. And from now on, you will not be ascend into heaven for all eternity. And it has been decreed that you will be bound on earth for all the days of eternity. Right. And again, Jude had something to say about the same thing, that fallen angels are under bondage in the underworld. Enoch was trying to explain just which angels those were, equating them with the Genesis 6 guys. So, uh, if you go to the site and download the document, the last two pages of it are some rather lengthy quotations from the book of Enoch. By the way, uh, up here we saw some of these phrases between brackets. Uh, the book of Enoch has come down to us in three languages, primarily in Ethiopic. 
an ancient form of Ethiopian language called Be'ez, which similar to Hebrew and Arabic. Uh, then we have a Greek translation made for, either from the original Aramaic or from something maybe from Ethiopian. And then amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, portions of Enoch have been found, though never bundled with biblical texts. So we know the book was being read during uh, Second Temple times. This brings us then to the descent of Jesus into hell. So he is put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and made proclamation to give the prison spirits to those who are disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the yard was being dead. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. What do you suppose that refers to? Death and resurrection. Well, some say, well, that's the death and the resurrection and that whatever else happened was after he was resurrected, which literally cannot be true, so you have to spiritualize it and give it. Or some say that he had preached spiritually back during the time of Noah. To evangelicals and Protestants who don't know Bible backgrounds or whose rationality does not admit a spirit world have to make up stuff. And a lot of Bible commentary is just made up. But I'm going to suggest here that the point is, though he was, he died physically, he was still alive spiritually. During that time, between the death and the resurrection, he went and made a proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Well, where are they? They're in the underworld. That's several biblical names. The grave, Sheol, Tartarus, Hades, the fiery place, the loss, the darkness, the dust of the earth, for Satan has bit the dust. What was the proclamation that he might have made? You're lost. You're going to stay there. You're lost. You're going to stay there. You haven't won. I have. You haven't. <laughs> yes. You haven't won what? When you killed me, you didn't win. When you killed me, you actually liberated human beings from your own control. They are now coming back to Yahweh. And you guys, you've look, you lost the humans, now you're at least those who come to faith in Jesus, and you're going to stay here forever. Well, look at you, you're down here with us now. You are dead. Well, yes, I am dead, but uh, wait three days. <laughs> now these are those who have been take a disobedient while the ark was being built. Well, who was that? This is a reference to the fallen sons of the gods. So I'd like to suggest a summary of Jesus' career that includes some of these elements of the first Timothy passage. By backing up a little bit, because there's a reference here to it, I'm going to mention that certain angels became disobedient to Yahweh, as Peter said, long ago. However, eight human souls were saved in Noah's ark. Thereafter, the Son of God would occasionally appear to humans in the person of the angel of Yahweh. Sometime thereafter, the Son became incarnate in flesh as Messiah Jesus. Jesus then suffered to take away our sins. The just for the unjust, well, unjust what? Unjust demons? Unjust spirits? Unjust spirits. Unjust human beings. Those of us who dwell in flesh. And to bring us to God. Well, Jesus then was made dead in his flesh by crucifixion. Seventhly, the Son then was made alive in the Spirit. And then eighthly, the Son accompanied a repentant thief to paradise. I knew Ron would bring up the repentant thief. <laughs> because the way he thinks, all the details, how do they fit together? <laughs> and then he descended into the underworld prison and made a proclamation to disobedient spirits. You guys will never get out of here, but I would. Eleventh, Jesus is risen from death back to life, physical life, with a glorified body has now gone into heaven, to the right side of God. Oh, that's still in this first Peter passage. 
angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to Jesus. And so now Jesus brings us to God through baptism, which now saves us. Not the watery part, but that appeal to God to have all of our sins forgiven. In the book of Revelation, when the Lord Jesus comes to appear to John to give him this message for the church, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the, the keys of death and Hades. He went down there, he grabbed the keys, <laughs> probably before he got there. He opened up Hades, all the righteous from the ages past are now released from the underworld, are taken into the holy city of God, Zion, in the heavens, which will one day ascend and occupy our own planet. So, what's the importance of all of this? Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's what, right, Yahweh had said to Israel. But now that Israelites and Gentiles are coming together as the new body of Christ, here's what he says to the church. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Israel has been the kingdom of priests, the holy nation, but failed. We are now the holy nation, the royal priesthood. How could we possibly fail? The dark powers are watching our behavior to know where our loyalty lies.